Welcome back. We're continuing to look at arenas in Christ, and I'm defining that as God's providential settings to live out spiritual intimacy in word and deed, specifically to live out his purpose in Christ, to become more and more like Jesus, because Jesus shows us the spiritual intimacy. He shows us the heart of God. So that is our purpose, and we have specific arenas in which God has orchestrated for us to live. But believing God for that, resting in the fact that that is true, and delighting in the fact that that is good will always require His Word to inform us and His Spirit to empower us. Let's consider some passages as we think through this together. First, God's Word informs us of our obligations and our opportunities. We are always obligated to believe God for who He says He is. We're always obligated to do what God calls us to do. But because of specific arenas that we're in, we have unique opportunities. So universal obligations and unique opportunities. And here's some specific examples of that. Uh, we talked about, for example, that God chooses the times and places that we live in in Acts 17, 26, 27, which is also our memory verse that we'll come back to later, says exactly that. So we have in God's word the stated fact that he is sovereign over when we are born. I was born in the 20th century. Some of you were born in the 21st century. Uh, I was born in the south of the United States. Some of you were born in other countries. God chooses those times and those places in order to draw us to himself or provide that opportunity. And for us as believers to live out our lives and to proclaim the gospel in ways that are unique for others to hear because of what it's like to live in a different era and in a different place. Family. Um, Exodus chapter 20, verse 5 and 12 emphasize the impact of family. It says that uh, God holds people accountable down to the third and fourth generation who take his name in vain. And then in verse 12, he calls us to honor our father and mother. So there's a, an allusion to a generational curse. Now, that doesn't mean that if I'm a bad person, that my kids are cursed and my uh, grandkids are cursed because of me. But the impact of what I do will have consequences for them down generations. Therefore, in verse 12, he says, honor your, honor your father and your mother because the Israelite parents were supposed to teach their children what God had said about himself, his truths, his promises, his commands, his character, uh, the true stories that he had done for them. So family uh, and the way that it shapes us is informed by what God's word says about family. Our health, God's word also informs us about how, how to live out these arenas. In John chapter 9, uh, you may remember the man who's born blind and the disciples say, Lord, who sinned, this man or his parents? And Jesus says, neither one. But this happened so that um, when the Lord heals him, I'm paraphrasing, that uh, it would be a clear manifestation of God's glory. Not that he had some kind of eye problem, but everybody in the community knew this guy was blind. And so it was a clear miracle. And the Lord does allow some health issues to draw us closer to him or to draw others closer to him. We read in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7, that Paul was given a thorn in the flesh by Satan to keep him humble. And he's speaking about himself in that passage in the third person. He says, I know a man who went to heaven and he saw God uh, in person, and a thorn in the flesh was given him by Satan. Satan did it, but God used it to keep him humble. And Paul even asked for it to be taken away three times, and we're, we're pretty sure this is a painful eye disorder because several times elsewhere, and I'll put some scriptures here where you can see this, Paul says to a church, I know that if you could have, you would have given me your own eyes. See with what large letters I write. Uh, this, this scribe is writing this for me. All these alluding to the likelihood that Paul couldn't see well, and he was given this physical affliction of pain in his eyes so that he would not become uh, arrogant or proud for the vision that he had seen of heaven itself. Government. 
the last uh, half of chapter 12 in Romans and the first half of chapter 13 in Romans talks about um, not cursing those who curse us, but blessing those who curse us, even feeding our enemies and caring for them. But if you can't live in peace with them, it's okay to go to the governing officials because every governing official that exists has been instituted by God himself. It says in Romans chapter 13, I think it's the very first verse. It even says he doesn't bear the sword for nothing, that governing official, whether that's a um, some a person in the legal system or somebody uh, in, in higher government, uh, even the military. And of course, there are bad governing officials. But remember that Jesus paid the tax to the Romans who hired the soldiers who crucified him. How's that for a paradox? So even the governing officials over us is an arena that God sets up for us to proclaim and live the gospel in obligatory ways, truths and in, 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 uh, obedience that we can't compromise on, but in unique ways, unique opportunities, because now in certain places there is, can I say, the opportunity to suffer for the gospel that is greater than in other places where the government is different. And the Lord has allowed that for his glory so that people can see, wow, this is the real deal. When they are squeezed, they really love Jesus. Psalm 107, verses 33 to 30, uh, 43, 33 to 43, says the Lord even uses the weather to discipline the arrogant and to uh, care for the needy. Uh, the Lord, his word tells us over and over that he is sovereign in all of these arenas for his glory and the good of his people, even if that good includes discipline so that others can see us under pressure. So God's word informs us of our obligations, namely what we are to believe and what we are to do. Those are uncompromising, universal obligations. But God's word also informs us of unique opportunities. His spirit empowers us to live in those arenas. Let me cover those same arenas and we'll look through this for good reasons to believe God for them. Consider the era and the place. Uh, Esther, chapter 4, verse 13 and 14, you're probably familiar with. Uh, Esther is a, a Jewish woman who is living uh, under a, a, an enemy government. They have taken the Israelites into captivity. She grows up um, uh, under the care of her uncle, Mordecai, and the king's wife, basically, um, this ungodly king, He's not pleased with her because she's got some dignity and some self-respect. You can read that for yourself in the first chapter of Esther. And so he goes looking for another wife. And uh, a bad guy, uh, Haman, is trying to uh, persecute the Jews. Really doesn't like Mordecai because Mordecai won't give him respect. But in the meantime, uh, the king is looking for a new bride. And he, he has a beauty contest and he picks Esther. And Esther becomes the new queen. And Haman, as he's trying to, to kill off the Jews, uh, Mordecai, Esther's uncle, goes to him and says, you can go before the king and ask that this not happen. And she's afraid because she knows under this, this king's law, this other culture, this other government, that if she does this, she could be executed for walking in the king's presence, this ungodly king, uh, for, without him requesting her. But Mordecai says, who knows, but you have been placed here for such a time as this. Now, it's interesting that the book of Esther doesn't even mention the word God or Lord or anything alluding to God's work. But God's sovereignty is all over the book of Esther. Uh, the different times that the king couldn't sleep, that something was recorded in his uh, chronicles that he read. He found out later about Haman's plot. Uh, lots and lots of sovereignty of God in that. Family is another arena in which we need God's Spirit to empower us to live out the purpose of Christ. In Matthew chapter 10, verses 19 and 21, we're told that uh, even fathers and, and mothers will turn against their kids and kids will turn against their fathers and brother will betray brother uh, because of hatred of the gospel. 
And during that time, he says, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit of your Father, speaking to the disciples, uh, will, will speak for you so that when in those times of distress and betrayal, that God will honor your faith in him so that you can be faithful to the gospel, the good news, even to those family members who are betraying you. We need God's Holy Spirit for our health as well. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, uh, Paul talks about one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit as healing. And elsewhere in all of the Gospels, we're told that when Jesus healed, it is often in connection with driving out evil spirits. So that doesn't necessarily mean that every situation of bad health is because of an evil spirit. I'm not saying that at all. But I'm saying that there's a strong connection between God's spirit as our hope of physical healing uh, and evil spirits having their toll uh, on people physically. We need God in every way, not just for our spirit relationships, but for our physical health as well. Government is another arena in which we need God's spirit to empower us. In the book, book of Ezekiel, there are two uh, Hebrew words side by side to describe God, uh, Adonai Yahweh, which uh, some translations render Lord God and others translate as Sovereign Lord. Uh, the NIV translates it as a Sovereign Lord 210 times in the book of Ezekiel. Because in the book of Ezekiel, the Israelites have been taken captive, as they have uh, uh, a couple times in Scripture, and they think that because they're in a different geographic location, that maybe God is just the God of geographic Israel, but he's not the God of, of where they are in the book of Ezekiel. And so the prophet Ezekiel tells them over and over and over, look, God is sovereign. He has put you in that other land to discipline you because of uh, your consistent rebellion and not trusting in him and the way you abuse each other and you won't listen when he brings his prophets and he disciplined you in, in verbal ways and now he's gone to a more intense discipline in, uh, in the hopes of bringing you back to repentance and life. So we need God's spirit uh, to bring us back to repentance and the Lord can even use governments over us to discipline us so that we will trust in him and not the hope of our own government and not the fear of another government. You can see certainly in um, Ezekiel 36 and 37 where he describes Israel as a bunch of dead dry bones. But it's God's Spirit who brings them back to life and this is a prophecy of the fact that the Holy Spirit will come in the times of the New Testament and now to give rebirth so that our hope is certainly not uh, in a good government, and our fear is not in a bad government, but our life is in God, who is our King, and gives that life by His Holy Spirit. We need God's Spirit to empower us, and we even, even see this in an analogy of the weather. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 6-9, through 9, we're called uh, God's field, and we're called God's fruit. And he says, uh, some uh, weed and some water and some plant, but it's God who makes it grow. Now, that's a loose tie to the weather. But he's saying there, uh, we can do lots and lots of work, but it's up to God to prosper that work. He is our hope to bring about the result. So we always need God's word and God's spirit to believe in him for those arenas, to trust in him that they are really from him and they are really good to provide unique opportunities to live and, and proclaim the gospel. A couple of years ago, I was introduced to uh, a man named Nabil Qureshi. I didn't meet him, but I was told about him in a book he had written called Seeking Allah, Finding Jesus. Nabil Qureshi, if you don't uh, know who that is, uh, was a Pakistani-American, was raised in a uh, conservative, a morally conservative Islamic family. His dad was in the uh, United States Navy and uh, they very much valued education and uh, moral relationships and honesty and integrity and by uh, every account that, that you and I would describe as uh, being good citizens, they were excellent citizens. And his dad wanted him to go into medicine and he wanted to go into medicine, so he went to, I think it was Old Dominion, uh, which has a lot of Christian roots, the school there, but it's got a great reputation as well uh, for pre-med. 
and he met a uh, or lived with a Christian roommate. And you can read this in his book. They uh, got along really, really well, and they agreed at some point after some deeper conversation uh, that the Christian would read the Quran and Nabil would read the Bible. And they would also look into the roots of where their religions came from, uh, namely what non-Christian sources said about Jesus and what uh, uh, non-Quran sources said about Muhammad. And so uh, through this investigation, his book describes this process where the family he grew up in that he didn't get to choose, the, the country he grew up in that he didn't get to choose, these sovereign settings, this roommate that he got that he probably didn't get to choose, all these things were arenas that God used to save him. And because of uh, the radical nature of his salvation, and because of the book that he published, he also gained a lot of notoriety, had very unique opportunities, uh, technology and, and uh, in publications and video and other things became a platform for him to live and proclaim the gospel. And then his health took a very bad turn. At the age of 33, he was diagnosed with stomach cancer and in about a year, he was dead. But even the way that he died and the way that he suffered and the pain of his uh, death and the financial struggles of his family all of those things the Lord used, he didn't delight, the Lord didn't delight in any of those things, but he used those things for a powerful testimony of what it means to trust in the Lord and to love and for that to be a very real thing, a supernatural thing that comes from him that's not cultural, that doesn't come by osmosis of, of uh, 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 reading a book, or anything else, no self-help books you'll find in a store, but a true supernatural transformation by the truth of God's Word and the work of His Spirit. Let me give you a couple of practical exercises that may be helpful to you. Uh, think of one of your arenas and name which one is easiest for you to believe that it's from God, that it's sovereignly arranged, the time you were born, the, the place you grew up, the family you came into, whatever. Uh, name which one is easiest for you to believe and why. Then name one of the arenas that is hardest for you to believe that it is sovereignly from God for your good and for others' good and why. In a second practical exercise, begin to memorize Acts chapter 17, verse 26 and 27 that speak about God uh, choosing when and where we are born so that we and others may find Christ, because those provide unique opportunities. Still universal obligations to live the way he's called us to live and to trust who he is, but also unique opportunities because of those arenas. Tomorrow we'll look at what it means to live those arenas for the benefit of others, and I hope that you'll stay with us and see us then. Okay, here's our outro. Uh, once you've seen this, you don't necessarily need to watch it again. It kind of summarizes uh, what we're doing and, and why we're going there. Uh, you can picture love, which is how Jesus summarized the Ten Commandments. I think we could even say uh, summarize all of God's Word as love. You can picture it in the cross, uh, that we believe God for love through our understanding down to the heart level where we rest, we live that love for others, we receive love from others, and we give love back to God. And we do that in a number of ways. One of the elements of love is presence for the guilty or the shame. Second is candor for the guarded or the rebel. Safety for the at risk. Helps for the needy. Purpose for the disoriented, because we're talking about a journey. Arenas for groups. And an arena is a place of uh, competition. It's a place of being on display for your skill set. It's a place of belonging. So all of us, God has placed in different groups. Duties for the individual. And lastly, peace for the journey. 
and we'll take uh, each day of the week, Monday through Friday, to look at a different aspect of one of those. Each week we'll do uh, one element, but on Monday we'll look at the glory and the struggle. On Tuesday we'll look at what it means to believe God for that element of love. On Wednesday, what it means to live that love for others. Thursday, to receive that love from others. And Friday, to give that aspect of love back to God, both in blessings uh, and our burdens, so praises and prayer requests. You can see, and I'll flash several scriptures up here, that scripture reveals that love always comes from the love of the Father, through the grace of the Son, by the power of the Holy Spirit, to reconcile undeserving people for glorious relationships in the body of Christ, especially as we journey together through this dark and broken world. You can look at some of those different scriptures in, in depth and you'll see that it's a whole love. It's not just feelings. It's not just actions. It's not just what we get uh, out of it. But it's a gracious love in Christ that both forgives and transforms us to glory in Him. We'll, uh, we'll do one of these elements each week, and I hope that you'll turn in, uh, that you'll tune in with us as we look at what love is and love does because of Jesus. See you then.